Hello, uh, my name is Grzegorz Spiewak and today uh, I would like to persuade you to mind the map <laughs> or perhaps uh, more seriously speaking to help the learner better consolidate, organize and remember key vocabulary for exam and other purposes in fact. Why would that be a problem? Well, you know, if you look behind the covers of um, a good learner's notebook then you will see what the problem is. Well, you know, there is a reflex way to do these things, is it not? The reflex way, one that I'm sure you also remember from your own history of learning and studying, is that, you know, if you have vocabulary to record, you will produce a vertical list. On the left-hand side, the English words or phrases, on the right-hand side, the Polish translations. Well, sadly, it looks like a inaccurate, <laughs> incomplete version of something that somebody else has done before you and professionally it is called a dictionary, right? So, you know, one response uh, might almost be to help the learner use dictionaries more effectively instead. Online dictionaries, printed dictionaries, thesauruses, etc. But that's not what I am going to be talking about today. Rather, I would like to invite you to offer the learner, if you like, a menu, a diet of alternatives, options, options for recording and for uh, organizing vocabulary, particularly when there is a lot of it. <laughs> Why would there be a lot? Because they are learning towards an important exam, for instance. What are those options? Well, let's take those options in turn. Option one, use the sound. Why sound? Because sound is how we first come into contact with words, including our own language. Speaking of which, let's take three examples from Polish. What would the significance of these three words be for learning the English equivalents? Well, take a quick look at the Polish first. And here is the answer. This is how this particular learner is using Polish, meaningless, nonsensical, but effective through the sound in order to uh, better remember the three items in English. Now, could this be done the other way around? Yes, it could. Here is an example from an American friend of mine who uh, had trouble learning the word chimney in Polish. And you know what he did? Where well, he actually associated the word chimney with the English sound chimney. Now, you will appreciate that here it's actually quite a tricky little thing because, of course, it's not just the phonetics of the two words, but also the fact that it's dark in the chimney. <laughs> and this is what really fixed that particular word in that person's memory for a long, long time. That image is almost like a mini network, a network which uh, helps establish that particular connection for a long, long time in the user's mind. I will come back to networks in a moment, but first I would like to show you a couple more options. This is an option where you use the space available, two-dimensional space in a notebook, and you exploit that space better with the help of uh, a technique, a technique of spacing things out. So, you know, instead of building a boring vertical list involving, in this case, parts of the body, you basically map them out all around the page and you build an image of a person using the vocabulary. You will notice that, in fact, you need to use some of the items twice because we have two shoulders, we have two knees, etc. Okay? Speaking of uh, uh, unlocking and expanding, you know, the moment you start expanding, the sky is the limit. Or perhaps the internet is the limit. There are lots of sites on the internet, like this one, for instance, called Taxido.com, but mind the spelling, <laughs> which lets you put in any text, small or large, and turn this text into something that I think is word art, is it not? Uh, and it's not just the heart, there are about 40 different images to choose from, and of course an arrangement of colors and uh, sizes of the font, etc. In other words, you can do a lot to, if you like, match your visual imagination to the lexical area which you wish to study. Take a look at option number three. Option number three is about something else a little, which is using the, if you like, the arrangement of the letters themselves. Why would that be important? Because it's a way to avoid endless translation. Take a look. 
uh, this word. Do you need to translate? No. The shape itself tells you what it means. How about this one? Instead of translating, you isolate the word itself. How about color adjectives? Well, of course, if they are color adjectives, you could actually record them in different colors. What about recording physical contrasts? You know, again, it's adjectives, but you know, why not use the shape of the font in order to communicate the meaning? Or, if you get really creative, how about making uh, little uh, vocabulary arrangements which will span a particular line and unlock your imagination even more? I hope you see what the overall image here is. The image is that it need not be vertical, it need not be the only way, right? But there is one rule that kind of underscores all of those three options. And the rule is, well, <laughs> organize, organize and organize. Why organize? Because it is the organization that helps memory. That's the basic intuition. Now, would this uh, not work for that kind of organization? Well, th this is obviously some kind of organization as well. Well, it is, but you see, it is monotonous. It is monochromatic. In other words, it is an organization which, in a sense, only uses one type of analytical skills that the brain possesses. Can we use the other half as well? Well, in a moment, I'll try and persuade you that indeed we can, and not only can, but in fact should, uh, particularly when there is a lot of vocabulary to process. Why a lot? Because there's an exam happening in one, two or three years' time, and the exam involves, as you know, not one, but 15 main lexical areas. This is just a sample of one such area, and of course, <laughs> this sample needs to be multiplied by 15. In uh, uh, any lexical area, if you look at the actual vocabulary specification, there will be around 200 words. So, if you now multiply by 15 lexical areas, you will end up with a rather um, daunting stock of about 3,000 items, which the learner needs to actively uh, insert into their memory. So, how can this be done? Well, it's a question of... Uh, if you, if you like, going beyond just the left brain, right? Left of itself is not right. So how can we make the left and the right work together? Well, by perhaps, again, showing the learner a technique which will not be a one-off, a technique which they can use on a systematic basis and start building their vocabulary stock in a way which reflects the way that the brain actually, naturally wants to learn it. How? Well, let's take one example. This is, if you like, the same list, the one that I showed you uh, a bit earlier on, uh, but transformed into a partial word map. Why would that be a good alternative? Because that kind of word map is actually inspired by a technique introduced some time ago, a technique which was not invented for language learning as such, but a, te a technique which was used to record and organize knowledge of various kinds. This technique, you will not be surprised, is the technique of mind mapping. What's mind mapping about? Well, notice that uh, the basic thing here is images and links. Why links? Because it is the links that created the connections, just as the brain creates the connections. Take a look at my example here. What's the connection between the idea of mind map and the beetle? Well, the connection, of course, is uh, not complete yet. So to fill in the missing node, I'm going to introduce you to the work of Tony Buzan, the one who is credited with the technique of mind mapping, but in fact, he only made it popular. Popular when? Well, that's what the beetle is to remind me of, you see, because the beetle, of course, is linked mentally with the hippie movement. The hippie movement is uh, the 1960s, and that's when Tony Buzan started seriously working on mind maps, you see. Now, of course, he wasn't the inventor. Uh, the technique itself was used uh, uh, by very distinguished predecessors, including uh, Picasso, I learned, and Leonardo da Vinci, and as early as the third century by uh, a philosopher called uh, Porphyrus of Tyrus. Now, this one used the technique not for his own work, but rather to record the ideas of someone who uh, he respected a lot. And this was, uh, 
well, not Maria Callas actually. Maria Callas wasn't around at the time, but why am I using this particular image? Because I am thinking of who Maria Callas married famously. His name was Aristotle Onassis, wasn't it? And Aristotle is there to remind me of the Greek philosopher whose work uh, Porphyrus really valued, Aristotle the philosopher. So I am using one image to create a link in my mind uh, for another image and this is what helps this particular uh, chunk of knowledge uh, get fixated in my memory. This is what mind mapping in a natural and trivializing it of course means for general knowledge storage but what about vocabulary? Well to talk about vocabulary there is something else that I would like to tell you which is that mind mapping in fact is itself inspired uh, by a number of different uh, ideas and things that we learned in recent decades about how memory works. Just to give you a little flavor, um, the von Restorff effect. It's an idea that we tend to remember things which stand out, such as perhaps an image of the beetle or the image of uh, Maria Callas, rather than, you know, boring figures and names which mean nothing except being just, you know, d uh, blots uh, of ink on a page. Uh, another important source of inspiration is the network theory, which says that the brain of itself naturally it creates semantic and affective links. But in order to create an affective link, there needs to be an emotion, of course. Speaking of which, mood theory, the third source of inspiration, which says that we tend to recall things with the mood with which they were originally learned. Now, I hope that all of this shows you how we can use those sources of inspiration in the aid of long-term vocabulary retention. I don't just mean, you know, short notes which are useful the next day. I mean notes which, in a sense, the mind can recreate when needed. For instance, when, when uh, the learner enters an examination room in a year's time or two years' time, perhaps. So, let's go back to the idea of word mapping. The critical thing is that it's not a ready image. It's not something which you just give the learner on a plate. Rather, it's an invitation to a process. Hence the name, mind mapping. In other words, it's the ing that matters, right? How do we take the learner through the process of uh, uh, um, building and storing vocabulary in a way that helps retrieval? Well, let's take it in steps. What's step one? Well, step one will be a partially filled mind map, one which you present the learner with and you invite them uh, with one color, say blue or black, to uh, fill in using as much as they already can before they even begin the process of study, if you like the initial stock taking. What happens next? Next, learning happens. You know, with the help of a good book, you will take the learner gradually through the lexical area in question, in, the, in this case it's man, człowiek, and you will take the learner through the different nodes of that lexical area, equipping each of these nodes with a series of good, varied exercises. Let's take a couple of examples. Here we have uh, uh, personal features. So what do we do with this? Well, we, you know, we give the learner a series of exercises amongst which uh, the, process, uh, the, the purpose is to give the learner new vocabulary, which they hopefully will be able to add to their mental network a bit later. Of course, it's not just one area. Uh, if you like, uh, the map is there to guide the learner from one node onto the next. So what about uh, uh, personal appearance? Well, another set of vocabulary in a slightly different format. Notice this one uh, shows uh, something else about the process, which is that it's not enough to just give the learner a list to memorize. If you give the list uh, separated into individual vocabulary exercises, then the learner has a range of different mental operations which they can uh, engage in order for that vocabulary to be fixated in their brain a bit more effectively. Involving, for instance, the sorting. Sorting is very important. Categorization of any kind is important because this is extra mental effort which helps long-term retention. And so they are being taken from one node of the map onto the next. Speaking of which, uh, let's look at just a third example of it. 
The third example is about how you use the vocabulary and you say something true about yourself with that vocabulary. Again, we know that personalization is one of those operations which help long-term retention. Or perhaps uh, using another related set of vocabulary anchored inside a piece of text, such as a blog in this particular case. What does it all lead to? Well, it leads into a step two. What's step two? Well, critically, use a different color, say green. And with that different color, you reproduce your own history of learning. Why? Because now the map gets bigger, right? We had the blue or black uh, step one, and now we have a green step two. What happens next? Well, more learning and teaching happens next. Since we've introduced the basic vocabulary set already, time has come to filter that set and expand on it with the help of examination style exercises right? Using the four examination skills. And this will give the learner a chance to reprocess and uh, reorganize the vocabulary and lead into step three. What's step three? Will you revisit the map for the third time. Why? Because instead of a big list, you now have an opportunity to look at the map and expand it the third time round using a different color still, say red. Why red? Well, you know, the choice of color is irrelevant, but what is relevant is that it is a different color. Why? Because now you will end up with a three-colored uh, multiple uh, node object, which is at least partly built by the learner himself or herself. This object, I think, is a perfect tool for repetition. It's the kind of repetition which makes sense. Speaking of repetition that makes sense, perhaps you would like a little comic relief at this point, uh, which shows just you know, what can go wrong with repetition. Uh, imagine uh, you know, the standard teacherly reflex uh, of uh, preaching at the learners, stuff like uh, you know, repeat something 10 times in order for it to become yours. And you know what that male learner at the back of the room is thinking now? You know, use something 10 times until it becomes yours. Well, here is what they really want to use. 10 times at this particular moment in time. So, you know, what I'm trying to say is that repetition of any kind and of whatever is not necessarily a gateway to success. What matters is that this repetition, if you like, is quality repetition. And what is quality repetition? Well, I showed you. There are several different options, no single correct way, but what matters is that each of these options uh, will involve a degree of active reconstruction and reorganization of material involving the learner herself or himself critically. Why? Because it is their network that matters, not the network that I create for the learner necessarily. Okay? Now, this kind of networking or mind mapping uh, is also a way to help them cope with some of those complex examination style tasks. Take task one, for example, the familiar structure, uh, the structure where you have a mini scenario and four items to cover. Now, if you think about this and look at it from a sort of visual perspective, doesn't it not look like the beginning of a mind map almost? Well, with one important proviso, however, the proviso that you will not give everything on the plate for the learner, right? So my idea here would be that with a task like task one, why not we withhold the four speech items and invite the learner first to predict? what's going to come into the bubbles. Now you might say, well, will they be able to? Well, that's my intuition. I think they will, because most of those scenarios are in fact quite predictable. This one says, you know, you work at a reception area, it's a summer camp type of thing, you sell language or some other type of course, and you have an English speaking customer ringing you to inquire about, well, inquire about what? Well, that's the four speech bubbles. Is it that difficult? Well, you know, yes and no. It might be quite difficult in an examination room, but that's where exam preparation, true exam preparation comes in, right? We can help the learner predict. We can help the learner build the kind of network, particularly that in the examination room, there will not be time to take any physical notes. So let's take mental ones, right? What kind of things? Well, you know, a customer is ringing. What will they want to know about? Probably about what kind of courses you offer. 
who is going to be teaching these courses, uh, you know, when one can enroll, how much it's going to cost, and perhaps what it is that they are going to learn at the end, right? You know, not rocket science, no doubt, but a process of preparing and organizing material for the learner, very much inspired by the original idea of mind mapping, right? Building a network. And of course, this could be the beginning of even more networking with each of those four nodes being the beginning of something else that the learner will plot around them. Of course, there's no time to go into this in depth here, but I hope you get the general picture. Speaking of general pictures, how about using the mind maps for cumulative vocabulary recycling in the classroom? Well, I suggest to you that uh, there are a number of ways you can do this, but the important thing is, again, that they treat this as a process and not as a product. How can this be done? Well, imagine, for instance, you divide your group into uh, groups of two or three, and you give each of these groups a large piece of paper. On the piece of paper, you give them a segment of the original vocabulary map to fill in. And then, after two or three minutes, they need to swap and use the uh, fellow learner's partially filled map in order to build more network and more network, and they swap again and again. Could this be done with different vocabulary areas? Of course it could, because the whole picture is the big picture, isn't it? So, you know, imagine the 15 areas and imagine on a particular day you are using three of them, right? So in this case you are using transport, you are using uh, uh, work, and you are using shopping. With the three, you can get the learners now in small groups to work on their own individual maps, then swap and repeat the procedure. I hope it makes sense for you as an in-class revision technique inspired by the same overall approach and methodology. Last but not least, revision itself. Revision either to be done in class or individually. There is lots of revision to be done, we know that. But could we not use the same technique? The technique of working with a partially filled lexical network? I think we could. Here is one example. Uh, an example where a segment of a vocabulary map is um, unfilled to a certain extent and the learner needs to provide the translations from Polish into English. Or, to use another vocabulary exercise type, uh, the learner here needs to do a bit of multiple matching using the words in the box and putting them in the appropriate places in the map. Or, perhaps to take one more example, fill in the missing letters in some of the words on the map. Now, all of this, you might say, is all very nice, but how can I get enough material to build this into a program on a systematic basis? Well, the answer is you can now, with the help of a great new piece of free software available on the Macmillan website. The software is called Word Mapper, and it's there for you to generate as many partially filled uh, word maps as you want on any of the 15 examination topics and using any of the uh, vocabulary exercise types that I showed you plus a few more. Here of course there is no time or place to take you through all of this systematically but if you go to the website you will also get short very easy tutorials which will guide you step by step through the process. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that it all is about the kind of teaching that actually causes learning. Teaching which is about exploiting the natural potential of the brain. And speaking of the natural potential of the brain, let me finish by quoting Tony Buzan uh, uh, one more time. Uh, in one of his very famous publications, he argues that it is through the exploitation of those natural brain powers that we can help the learner to actually uh, come into the process of learning and come off with a number of positive emotions. And that's... Uh, my humble wish and thought that I would like to conclude with. I hope that we are together going to generate a bit of extra joy of teaching and perhaps also some joy of learning. Thank you very much and good luck.